We're not anti-fertilizer. We're just pro-farmer efficiency. And when we understand what our biology is doing and what that microbiome and that rhizosphere and what it is capable of doing, we start to look at things completely different. And at the end of the day, we're helping growers raise bushels more effectively and more efficiently, and that's our goal. Ladies and gentlemen, farmers, ranchers, and distinguished guests, thank you for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas, methods, trends, and techniques available to help your farm achieve higher levels of farm profitability. The Farm for Profit podcast is co-hosted by Tanner Winterhoff, the Iowa Bankerman, and David Whitaker, the Iowa Land Guy, where in tandem they will share their ideas and advice from industry experts. Thank you again for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long. And now, here's Tanner and David. Hey, listeners, welcome back to the Farm for Profit podcast. This is Tanner Winterhaw. This is Corey Hillebo. And David is on vacation. Yeah. Out in the wilderness. Yeah, I guess that's this is his payoff for running around all the time, <laughs> you know, being so busy. He actually gets to take a vacation once in a while. So like we said, Farm for Profit podcast, this is going to be a profit episode. You by now already know there's a difference between our Farm for Fun episode and our profit one. So we're going to hit a what's working in an ag segment and then jump into our general topic today. If you have a suggested topic, just like the one we're going to talk about today, please send it to farmforprofitllc at gmail.com. That's the number four. Or you can hit us up in our DMs anywhere on social media, farm the number four profit. Yeah. Thanks for helping us. Uh, grow our audience and the listener review today is brought to you by bw fusion they are focused on bringing innovative fertility nutritional and technology to the ag marketplace they combine their best in class products along with the 365 soil and tissue program to provide growers the tools necessary to address limiting factors in real time just like the 365 program your reviews are how we monitor our podcast in real time tanner what do we got for a review today i never get to read these this is exciting yep Big Zach 0627, so 0627, says, I love the podcast. I'm still catching up on it, but keep up the great work, guys. So that was a real feel-good review for us, yeah. Corey. We nice, simple, to the point. I like it. I like it a lot. So that was a great listener review. A lot of fun for me to finally get to share these listener reviews. But what's really exciting is as we sit in our combines, when this episode comes out, we have an exclusive offer. So... Now, if you contact BW Fusion through the link on our website, farmforprofit.com, or you reach out to the salespeople and you mention Farm for Profit, you now, with the purchase of 500 acres of Meltdown and the 401 team, in whichever form it might be, get one free field in the 365 program. And yeah. Get that done before December 20th. Yep. This Pay is for it by, before then. Only fourth quarter, 2021. This is a really important aspect for margins where uh, might not be as wide as they had been historically. We have good prices, but uh, all of our costs are inflated. So this is an exclusive benefit and the reason we have BW Fusion as a partner of the Farm for Profit podcast. So right now, that's what we've got to offer you today. Don't forget about them, bw-fusion.com. That's how you can go look up what they've got going on. And if you want this exclusive offer from Farm for Profit, you either got to find the link on our website or mention Farm for Profit when you talk to one of the BW salesmen to make sure you get all the benefits. The grower still covers the shipping costs and the sampling costs for the 365 program, but you get enrolled in their platform for free. They get one free field, though. One of them. Yeah. I can only imagine once they get into that one free field that they're going to want to sign up for more. But obviously, that's an extreme value, especially in a tight year. And that normally costs about $440. Wow. Per field. I did not know that. Yep. That is fantastic. So, yes, thank you, BW Fusion, for their partnership. That's truly what it is. We're helping our customers, our listeners, achieve higher levels of profitability by focusing on the efficiency of their soils. And now it is time for our What's Working in Ag segment. We've got a fun guest on the phone today for our podcast. We have Reed Thompson from over by Colfax, Illinois, on the phone. Welcome, Reed. Yeah, thanks for having me. What are you guys up to today out there? Getting ready for harvest, or have you got started? Yeah, we're... We're uh, in the final stages of a little bit of equipment prep, and then uh, we're kind of finishing up a, a new dryer project and uh, really just trying to get uh, 
get after the corn before it dries any faster or uh, maybe capture some of that early season premium that's still there. Awesome. So you and your dad farm together, is that correct? Correct, yes. What kind of farm do you guys have? Uh, could you go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, so uh, so we're a fourth-generation Illinois farm family. Uh, I farm with my father uh, in McLean and Ford County, Illinois, which is Bloomington to Gibson City, Illinois. Okay. And uh, we primarily grow corn and soybeans with the majority of our corn being commercial. Uh, and then our soybeans are a split between seed production and uh, commercial production. So when you're splitting those soybean crops up, now, does that require different processes uh, as far as, as harvesting, storing, and handling? Yeah, so some of the differences, obviously, you start with, with seed production, you're starting on the side of purity at planting time. So when we're planting our seed beans, you know, we're cleaning the planters out, making sure that there's no commercial seed or, you know, off varieties in there um, to make sure we maintain pre- uh, purity. Uh, but then, yeah, after, throughout the year, most of the herbicide applications are pretty consistent, but it really comes into harvest when we really have to make sure we're paying attention to, you know, clean outs, uh, storage and handling is different uh, than what we can do with our commercial varieties for sure. So do you do that with separate equipment? Are you running a separate combine or you clean everything out uh, between harvests? Yeah, so we run two two combines in, in beans. Uh, it's no different. Uh, same combines in commercial beans versus soybeans as well as what we use in corn. Um, but yeah, it, it is a, it's a clean out process, a little bit of manual labor cr- crawling around on the combines, you know, taking a leaf blower up into the grain tank, getting all those little nooks and crannies. And you can only get so much before you kind of flush the first load through. And then, you know, then you're pretty well set. Um, that way both machines are, you know, are, have a, good purity on what we're, we're getting through and we're not getting a bunch of weed seeds or, you know, something from the last field. Oh, it makes a lot, Um, makes a lot of sense. And then the big thing, like where it comes into, you know, storage is um, kind of a big thing too. We cannot in any sort mix with commingle with commercial beans, obviously, but then also corn is a big no, no. And so with the seed production, we've actually had to move to a whole separate, uh, handling system and uh, kind of re- redo our storage, if you will, uh, to kind of accommodate some of our seed production. So that means that you have two different ways of storing. Could you elaborate a little bit more? Is it is it a standard grain leg or what are you guys using? <laughs> Prior to having a larger chunk of seed production, we just kind of ran it through a standard, you know, grain, uh, grain pit, auger system. And, you know, it was fine because it all got crushed anyway. So it, kinda, it wasn't the best for seed quality. Um, but in 2020, we were able to get hundred percent of our acres converted over to seed production, uh, which also helped offset some, uh, costs and expansion projects we were working on here at home from a corn storage perspective. When we did that, we had to find a whole new way to plumb in and a cost effective way to plumb in, uh, a, a new, uh, filling system for our, um, filling and then unload system for our, our seed production and seed soybeans. And so in order, when we did that, we moved, uh, uh, we moved to a large uh, grain belt uh, by Brant's. Uh, and when we did that, we were able to pretty well isolate and kind of help keep separate our commercial varieties versus our uh, seed beans, as well as there was no chance of any corn or anything else getting in, getting in those systems. Oh, I get it. So, yeah, because you're using those, those grain belts for only the seed production handling. Correct. That's not... They're not used elsewise. So those grain belts, that's also referred to as a conveyor, right, Reed? Correct. Mm-hmm. Yes. So which which brand belts do you have? To fill our grain bins, uh, we run the uh, 2110 uh, harvest grain belt, and uh, that is what we use on um, on filling the, the belt or the bins. Uh, and when we purchased that, we decided to get one of their drive over grain decks as well. Oh yeah. Um, just because our help isn't exactly young. And <laughs> the idea was all of our systems prior were uh, a drive over pit system. And while it's like, well, we're used to this, this kind of provides a little bit of easier access and nobody's out there manually swinging augers and hoppers and things like that. And so we went with the grain deck to just kind of make that, you know, big belt more efficient uh, in the, for the truck drivers. 
So that 2110, so if I looked up on their website right, that's 20 inches wide and 110 feet long, correct? Correct, yeah. And they fill about a, it's like a, is it a 50-foot peak, 55-foot peak or okay. something like that is how high. So it's it's running up there pretty good. We we really can't push it any higher before the beans. Uh, you know, there, there's certain slopes that you can run, and sure. we're, we're pushing the upper end of it. and. Uh, what's amazing is the tractor we we put it on is like a 130 horse tractor and it oh, it really? like barely it it like barely idles and That's we can impressive. dump a load of soybeans and like we are by the time you get to the belt turn it on dump the front hopper move dump the back hopper 12 minutes holy smokes yeah it's so, it's unreal right so we're running a 120 foot Brant auger. And, mm -hmm. uh, it takes 200 horse on the front of that in order yeah. to get it to the peak when we've got it set at its steepest. I mean, you really don't want anything less than that. Uh, and it works it pretty good. We got a 4630 mm -hmm. on there. Um, that'll really put that to work. So that's interesting that these are pretty efficient. And I like the fact that you brought up that they're easy to use, that even your yeah. older help don't, doesn't seem like there's a lot of extra maintenance, uh, or extra hassle that goes along with, with running over the top, dumping into the, into the belt and sending them on up to the bin. The idea and the in everything and concept seemed good when we started making the decisions. When we actually put it into practice, it was even better. I mean, it it, really lived up, it was better, and if not, lived up to the uh, um, what we had hoped for. And really, it's kind of a kind of a convenience feature. We put the hydraulic steer on the thing, uh -huh. which which is a must. I mean, that's not even it's, it's it shouldn't <laughs> even be an option because 110 feet long is a long way behind you. And, you know, I moved from one 36 foot bend to the next. And I, all I did is I drove the tractor forward, kind of turned the wheel slightly, moved right. my hydraulic wheels, the auger or the belt creeped over. I twisted them again and I backed straight up and I was in position. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> There's none of this I'm jockey so, in it. I'm so well, jealous. <laughs> I've told everybody, I said, until you have hydraulic steer, you're, you just, you just don't know how hard it could be dealing with augers. And, and I think you're going to make a lot yeah. of our listeners jealous when, when they sit here and think about that hydraulic steer. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but now I've got a question since I only have experience on the auger side, how do you think that compares durability wise? You know, they talked, uh, and this, I, mean, I don't think this, probably some of their literature. I mean, they're, they're talking with guys that have run millions of bushels through these, these belts and wow. still haven't wore them out. We've run about a couple hundred thousand through our 2110, which is the 110 foot belt. And, you know, to date, I would tell you, you know, other than making sure you've got it aligned, cause we, cause you know, that's a learning curve. It's right. You yep. don't pay attention to alignment with augers. Right. Um, you know, you check for bearings and things like that and weird noises. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, so there's some learning curve to having a belt. Um, but from a quality of the grain going in, uh, the, the, the wear I saw on the belt was almost non-existent. Wow. And then you talk about the tractor, which, I mean, the tractor idled at like less than a thousand RPM. Right. And that was, <laughs> and, and we've got a, a little bit newer, a 6430 we put it on so we can actually control rpms as well as hydraulic flow uh and so we actually just kind of dial that thing down let her idle and away she goes uh, right. and so from a, like a maintenance perspective i would almost tell you there's less maintenance because there's no u-joints there's no other you know shear pins and things like that to deal with you've got some simple simple bearings there's about a half a dozen of them and you grease them, you know, about, you fill a bin, you grease them, you fill a bin, you grease them. It's not a, it's been very minimal maintenance uh, and minimal wear items <laughs> on it. Oh, I am not looking for, I shouldn't say I'm not looking forward to this fall, but now I know how smoothly it runs for you and what's working for you on your farm. The jealousy is just going to come pouring out my ears. I know it will. Uh, yeah. Well, and you know, we, we have an auger, we've got a, a 10 inch, 90 foot auger and we could have pulled it around, but then it was like, but why? Right. Like somebody would have to move the swing auger. Like oh. that doesn't sound fun. No, that doesn't. Not at and, all. Th and the person who's got to move it is me and everybody else is always gone when that happens. So <laughs> I just, you know, it's fine. Just drive over the deck. It's easier. Yeah, absolutely. No, that that's awesome. I really appreciate you taking time to jump on the podcast here. I'm glad that it's pre-harvest and we're not taking you away from uh, right in the heat and thick of things. Uh, also want to thank you for sharing what's working in ag on your farm, as well as products that Brant 
has uh, that you've purchased through Brant. Obviously, we want to thank Brant for their partnership with this podcast. Uh, it continues to amaze me the quality of products that they've got. I knew very little going into this partnership, and uh, it's fun to talk to farmers like you that have got these things in the field and are really happy with what they've got. Yeah, you bet. I'm I'm happy to happy to talk about it, and always happy to share our experience with them because, you know, the relationship we've had with Brant's been been kind of unique because of how we kind of got together and got this deal put together, but it's been nothing but uh, positive so far. Well, there you got it, listeners. That was Reed Thompson from over by Colfax, Illinois, talking to you about Brant products and what's working for him on his farm. Don't forget to go out and visit brant.ca to check out all their ag products. Remember, to succeed in farming, you've got to be tough and smart and have equipment that you can rely on. And that is why Brant puts the engineering and resources behind their grand handling products so you can entrust them in your operation. So thanks again, Reed. Really appreciate you jumping on the phone for us for this podcast. Uh, we're going to have to get you back on, learn a little bit more about your farm, but uh, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me and love to join another time. Awesome. Well, have yourself a good afternoon and we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, you too. All right. That was another one of our exciting What's Working in Ag segments, Corey. Now it is time to move on to our, I'm going to call a fall agronomy lesson. Are we going to just go to school tonight? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, it's a late night. We've got a bunch of guests in the studio, um, one from Indiana that apparently doesn't want to meet me during the daytime. He doesn't want to be seen <laughs> with me during, during the daylight hour. So he only comes out at night, only comes out at like eight o'clock, meets with me, you know, but, <laughs> um, so yeah, we have, uh, the BW fusion team here with us. So Let's just go around the table and introduce you guys. Let's start with Bodie Kitchell. What's going on, Bodie? Hey, how are you guys? Um, yeah, so Bodie Kitchell is, as Corey said, uh, National Director of Agronomy for uh, Biodyne and uh, BW Fusion. Um, my role is kind of to service our, our reps um, across the U.S. and our dealer network as well. Nice. Thanks for hanging out with us finally. We've got to do a lot of conversations over the phone. It's cool to have you in studio. It's just cool to have people in studio, yeah. period. But you feel uh, less like a like a loser. <laughs> <laughs> like you actually have friends. This, this is a real podcast yeah. now that yeah. people came <laughs> yeah. people came to hang out. I'm um, just impressed with the setup. Like I walked in here and I'm thinking, you know, I've seen some videos of this. But to see it in person, it's legit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Let's you. Cut that out, and uh, we'll make that a clip. That's the yeah. intro. Yep. That will be the first thirty <laughs> seconds. Exactly. I Approved. love that. Approved. All right, back around the table. So now we're going closest to Corey, another familiar face, familiar voice that you might have heard. Brody, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I have a better uh, better voice for a podcast than a face. So, but, uh, Brody Benton, uh, regional sales manager for BW Fusion, covering most of Iowa, uh, over to Nebraska, down in Missouri. Um, I've done a lot, uh, you know, before Mason and, and Bodie here with, you know, taking the 365 program to a lot of our trials and, and, uh, and like what Bodie said earlier, I'm just the guy that, you know, makes it look good on paper. So, <laughs> Hey, we all need one of those. It just so happens that I'm that for the podcast. Yeah. Oh, sorry, oh. Corey. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you take a bunch of garbage and make it, make it pretty good. I can tell you that. But the cool part is we made a new friend tonight. We got Mason in the studio, and I'm really excited to get uh, Mason's contributions today because I think he's got some behind-the-scenes information that not everybody gets. So, Mason, why don't you tell everybody about, about yourself? Sure, yeah. So I'm Mason Claude. I'm the uh, agronomy research lead, so I've been focusing all summer on the, the research trials that Brody first started, and then I've been kind of following up and been in, in and out of the fields every day uh, checking in on product performance. So you're the boots on the ground that both Bodie and Brody have talked about. Yep, yep. I, I'm the I'm the guy out getting heat stroke. <laughs> <laughs> as, as he looks affectionately at Bodie. So if you could see this, um, yeah, I think he definitely has carried a lot of the weight this summer, guys. Is that not right? For sure. Uh, definitely, for sure. Uh huh. Yeah, that was a politically correct <laughs> answer. So he's the guy that's in my field every time we're getting a soil sample or a tissue sample taken several times throughout the summer in the 365 program, right? Yep. I'm the guy rolling out of your field that it's sweating to death. Every time and, I saw a truck there on the ground. Yep. and I saw, and I saw there was a truck, I would lay on the horn, especially if I was in the semi. <laughs> Super <laughs> awkward. Made me nervous. I, I never knew who it was. Sometimes I, you know, and you never know what Brody's driving. So who knows? Well, yeah, since I had uh, <laughs> car, you know, vehicle trouble this, yep. this spring and had to use your truck to pull yeah. something. So I was like, oh, maybe yeah. it's him. I'll just honk. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. 
Well, Bodie, what brings you to Iowa? Because you're the one that traveled the furthest. Both these other two guys, they didn't say it in their intro, but are both Iowa guys. Uh, but what, what brings you to the state? Yeah, so um, we have a couple growers this year that are going to uh, they're going to enter the uh, National Corn Growing Contest uh, or the NCGA. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it, um, obviously, from planning to planting to the in-season apps. Um, but then I, I don't know, you know, maybe the most – difficult piece of this whole thing is is picking the right spot in the field um you know it's a 1.25 acre cut is what it is um if you go over 325 bushels you have to do a recheck if your recheck is 275 uh 275 is your number not 325 or 330 or whatever and so um there's a lot of uh planning that goes into this so um, yesterday, uh, there's a group of probably seven or eight of us uh, walking some fields, had a drone up, uh, trying to get some footage of above ground and then walking in just to see where the consistency of the ears are at. So um, really kind of the first time that, that I've been back here um, since early spring um, and uh, just an opportunity to walk some of the trials that we've got, um, talk to some of our dealers and our customers that uh, I've been kind of working with um, for the past couple of years. Well, that's kind of cool. I didn't realize that's how it worked. Did you know, Corey, that that's how the, the yield contest? I thought it was a 10-acre chunk that you had to do, but that, I guess that makes sense. And So it's a minimum of a 10-acre field. Oh, okay, so your field has to be yep. 10 acres, but then it's 1.25 acres out of that. And you got to make a pass down, and then you have to skip two header widths and come back if you don't have uh, or if you have to recheck. And so last year, uh, for example, I had a grower that um, I was on my way to South Dakota, actually up to the lab, and um, he uh, sent me a video uh, of his yield monitor, and he was running 307 to 374. The reason that we didn't use that piece was because it was an irrigated piece, and part of that was a dry land corner that came in, and so we wanted to stay out of the dry land corner. And uh, we went over uh, approximately 200, 250 feet, and made our pass and ended up with a 299.4 so it is you know it's it's uh you can walk fields and think that you've got a pretty good idea of things but you pick the wrong spot and you know it's the difference between really good corn or you know disappointing i mean the grower that i uh, worked with last year 299.4 uh, it, it's about as much of a kick in the nuts as anything. You know, you'd rather be like 250 instead of 299.4 because you're six tenths of a bushel yeah. away from 300. So. Right. I'm so, just trying to think of like how. Okay, so you're planning for this for next year. This is a dry year. Like the Canisteo soils that we have here in the Des Moines Lobe, like just a deep, heavy black soil. Next year, if it's wet, that's not right. going to be as well. You know, not going to be as good. But this year, it looks probably looks awesome. Yep. So yep. For sure. That's got to be hard to do. So then the, the interesting part is it almost sounds like you're penalized for having high yields because they make you do a second certification. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, really. Um, it's one, it's to bring some validity um, because if you, if you go over 325, they want to say, okay, repeat it then, right? You know, let's make sure it wasn't just a fluke that, that yep. your 1.25 acres was. But if you just pick the wrong spot and you go back in for your recheck and you're at 285, yeah, nobody nobody knows you're 325, yeah. right? Or you're 327 or whatever. They know you're 285. So there there is <clears throat> there's definitely an art uh, to it. And, and and one of the biggest things that I would tell anybody that's listening, if you want to do the NCGA, do it. It's it's fun. Um, you're going to learn a lot. But if you've seen 300 or 320 on your yield monitor, you have 240 bushel corn. Yeah. You have to have 400. Yeah. To get a 300 and above on a yield monitor and that's probably the biggest thing that 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 i've learned from the guys that have done this for a long time is is you know yeah that 300 oh that's pretty cool but you either have to sustain 300 from the moment that you pull in to the moment that you pull out right. or you got to have 400s on the top end i that's, can't say i've ever seen 400 i've never seen 400 <laughs> nope not until this not fall. until this year yeah when you yeah. get to see what your corn looks like yeah. after these bw fusion products yeah. but and it eliminates that farmer from saying okay i've got half mile rows every eight rows is a contest field because otherwise you just pick the entire thing and take out of the top you know whichever eight row pass it was yep and you have to have so you have to have a judge there uh they got to be completely independent so so nobody that is affiliated with anything that can monetarily gain from it 
So anybody that would be selling product, anybody that would be selling, you know, even precision planting parts, if, if there's something for you to monetarily benefit from, you cannot be the judge of that person. So they have to be there and you have to tell them, this is where I'm going to make my cut. You don't get to go and shell the field and say, hey, you know, this was really good back here. Uh-huh, I, yeah. I think we're just going to take this one. Yeah. That ain't how it works. Look at my yield map. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that's all part of the game. So Kelly Garrett, friend of the show, I know you followed him. Have you been out to his place lately? I was out in his place um, probably in mid April or May. Okay, so um, this is you're not going to his place on this trip back. Nope. So we've got two guys up in Northwest Iowa uh, that wanted to do the NCGA deal. Okay. Um, we did uh, the Chasing Francis documentary that, that Kelly's yep. um, been doing. Um, Jason Schley and I uh, actually went down there and uh, did some shooting of that early in the season. But, you know, from the BW side, we went from six reps last year, uh, regional sales reps like Brody, uh, to 16 in a matter of about eight months. Um, So we've got guys in Georgia. We've got guys in Arkansas. We have guys in um, Mississippi. Um, We've got dealers now in Idaho. I spent uh, a week and a half or two weeks ago I was up in Idaho. Um, So just, you know, just – nature of the business that the business continues to grow and hard to be everywhere uh, all the time yeah um so really this is my first opportunity back in iowa in quite some time you're gonna need another you yes yeah so that's uh that's mason um Ah. that scares me mason came to us uh mason came to us through a customer of ours i posted on twitter i said hey you know kind of a long shot this late in the game but really needed an intern to help out brody um brody had I think 18 or 20 trials last year um, that he was taking all of the data uh, on top of, you know, trying to have a family on top of selling product and managing dealers. And we had a conversation. I said, Brody, you can't, you can't continue to do this uh, in all reality. Like you, you can't be this guy. And I said, what do you think if I get you an intern to grab the data piece? And I think, uh, I think there was a little bit of him that didn't want to relinquish that because, you know, this, the data piece is his baby, and yeah. it has been. I fought back pretty hard. <laughs> but, but then, like, a day after, I was like, I was talking to my wife, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. Thank goodness Mason's here. This so. could be good. Tanner, are you uh-huh. taking notes right now? No. I'm not I, taking... feel like, I feel like you could, you could take a little bit of this in for the podcast side of things. Oh, gee, Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> he won't Every... relinqu- relinquish any editing and anything like that. Everything I've got is for, for hire if you want. <laughs> <laughs> you come right in ahead and do it. <laughs> so it, we, were, we were fortunate enough to, uh, to have a customer um, give us Mason's name and uh, – so this is how I either missed this or I didn't know this, but um, I thought that when we interviewed Mason that this was for a legit internship, you know, that he's going to be here for the summertime and, uh, you know, he's got to go back to school. And I think it was maybe the second interview. Uh, he said, actually, you know, I, I, I graduated from college in May. I've got an agronomy degree from, from Iowa State, and I said, I won't hold that against you. Um, oh, no. But... Uh, but <laughs> Sorry to anybody from yeah, Iowa that's an uh, Iowa State fan. Um, now you have two things to be disappointed about. I just <laughs> dogged you, and, and the Hawkeyes just smashed you. So uh, I may not be welcome back to Iowa, I guess. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm going to edit that out or not. He's a Big Ten homer, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but uh, so just he, he said, no, I actually graduated in May. And, uh, you know, just he, didn't, he had some opportunities he didn't want to go with. And uh, so I, I talked to the, uh, one of the owners of bw and i said you know we got to get this guy on more extended than just a three-month deal and uh fortunately we did and so mason's with us full-time in in his role congratulations mason in a sea of no one wanting to work you got a job yeah 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 Yeah, there wasn't much competition i feel like warm bodies like a call of desperation when Bodie reached out he's like oh my god somebody help me fire that guy is he just coming to check for his unemployment benefits (laughs) You know, we were really trying to build him up because he struggles with his self-esteem, and you just, you just had to tear him down, didn't you, Corey? Hey. We're, Go up two pegs, knock down one. We bring, we bring real information Gaining. to the Farm for Profit podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And thank you for sharing on what the experience is like competing in these national yield contests because I assume it's a lot the same on the soybean side uh, as you pick your spots, your trials, your plots, and, and try to compete. So uh, do you guys feel pretty good about your compliance this year? I'd say we, as a whole, yeah, um, starting to get some early yields back. Uh, guys are pleasantly surprised. Um, so, you know, 
It's okay. The USDA does not listen to this podcast. Uh, I understand. <laughs> I, internally, you know, myself with, with the growing season that we've had, with, with some of the things that we've done, optimistically, yes. Uh, I do, do feel pretty good. I think that there will be some guys that have some, uh, some legit numbers. Um, but it's, it's tough. You know, guys like Kelly that's, you know, posted big numbers before. you got guys like the Kevin Kalbs and the Brooke Cardinals of the world, you know. Those guys have all done really big numbers. So your your 300, which might be a record for you, might get you seventh or eighth in the state. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, what what would get you top three here in Iowa? I, I don't know. I don't know from a dry land. I think Kelly's got the irrigated uh, – well, he had the irrigated in 2019, maybe at 357. Okay. Um, I don't know what a dry land number would take. I think last year it was like – just under 300, maybe. Okay. I think right at 300 okay. or just under 300. So That's still pretty good. Which has always, like, boggled my mind because we go down to these places where, like, Hula is and Dowdy, and, like, we don't think of those as big corn-growing areas, and they just crank out the corn. And then you come up to Iowa, oh, they grow corn there, you know. <laughs> they grow a crap ton of corn there. Well, no, it, I mean, 300 is hard to do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And like yeah. you said, if you want 300 as an average – you can't only see 300 on your monitor. No. Yeah. That's that's exactly right. But let's kind of frame this up. We're fall agronomy. That's kind of what we wanted to, to frame into this episode is a little bit of a recap as to what we've done in 2021. But ultimately, it's about damn time to start preparing for 2022. Like, we, we have to plan right now, at least from what I've learned from you guys throughout the entire growing season or from the field segments. So... Brody, why don't you start off and, and kind of let us know what is the process that you guys have been wrapping up in the last 30 to 60 days since we've talked to you guys last? So over the last uh, 30, 60 days, you know, I guess we still wrapped up a lot of advance sales, advance applications in that fungicide R3 time frame on soybeans and, and corn. And, and uh, you know, really, you know, what Bodie and Mason have been doing along with myself and evaluating, okay, how is that crop finishing out right now? Because right now, I mean, it's, you know, we're still holding so, on to so a lot me, of yield. There. Let me interrupt you. This always helps our listeners. So we're recording this on the 15th of September. So to give, give our listeners an idea, this is going to come out a little bit later in October, uh, but we are sitting here the 15th of September. Yep. So we're evaluating how are things finishing out right now? And then, like you said, okay, starting the conversations for next year, you know, we know that, you know, input costs are up, cash rent costs are up. Um, but who knows what that commodity price is going to be like come next year. And so, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions and I'm sure Bodie and Mason have gotten a lot of questions on, okay, how do I make this more efficient? Knowing that if I do the exact same thing that I did last year, I'm 30, 40% less revenue than what I am in 2021. And I don't want to be that way because I want to, I want to make what I did in 2021. And that's where, you know, the microbial team, some of the information that we were talking about before and just showing some different slides on uh, availability of nitrogen, what's being put under the plant for phosphorus, you know, how is that crop finishing out? Because we're making or holding on to a lot more of that yield at this point versus allowing mother nature to, to dictate that for us. And, and you can see that over the last two weeks, if you drive across to Iowa, just, you know, the fields that have that superior plant health able to finish and those ones that are dying early. And so you got to ask yourself, okay, why, you know, why are they dying early? Yeah. We, we were out there chopping early, uh, grabbing some earlidge, obviously. And it, it was quite interesting. You come across the field and all of a sudden you just hit those sandy spots. Yeah. I'm naive to what additional factors would go into this, but you'd assume it's a drier sandy spot because boom, it's all fired up. And all of a sudden the powder, it just turns into powder coming out the spout of the chopper. And then you get into some better corn it lugs the whole thing down. And you start uh, rolling some black smoke. So I can, I have been noticing, you know, in my novice eyes, the variability in fields, both from corn and soybean side of things. And I think this is going to be a year that that's even magnified. You know, I think you guys with your heavy soils and a wet year, you see that too. You know, you want those sandy spots yeah. because that's what's going to carry you. And your your heavy, dark black soils are that's just going to hurt you. And this year, you know, that's variability is probably the word to use for this part of Iowa from here to the northwest. Um, anything with, with some sort of elevation that's going to repel water, probably 40 50 60 bushels off um your side hills going down into your slopes uh any or your bottoms anything that held water 
that corn still got the good appearance. It's got the good late season plant health. The shank attachment still really good. Anything up on as you start to get up that side hill on top of the hill, shank's starting to fall. You had premature ear drop, and and the corn's just you know 120 to 150 bushel corn. Yep. So I'm the farmer here, and you told me what I want to be thinking, and you know our inputs are going to be up. What what do we need to look for? going forward how can i how can i spend i got a dollar to spend how can i make that go the furthest the next year the first part is asking you know what is the lowest hanging fruit you know what is that residue that we have there that's sitting there that's holding you know a plant will, will bring up what 280 pounds of k and a 250 bushel crop i mean you're there's a lot of nutrients that's just sitting there that you just use that should be easily available to you so that's where the use of meltdown comes into play not only from that standpoint, but then also, you know, start setting yourself up for next year in that plantability aspect um, and, and, and uh, managing that residue as well. So those are places to start. Um, the other thing, you know, ask yourself as you're going through the, con- and, you know, right in the combine, are there things that I'm spending money on right now that I don't need to? Because I've already, I've already either built that bank or, you know, it's not going to bring me, it's not addressing a limiting factor. And so you're wanting to use Meltdown this fall. So I'm in the camp. We might have three different opinions here. Okay. So, so hold on. Just We have listeners that join us every single week. So let us okay. know again what Meltdown is. So Meltdown is a team of 30 different microbes that there's cellulose, lignin degraders, waxy degraders. There's fungal communities that break down that carbon and cycle it to then stimulate the entire microbial system. But if you are after the plantability aspect meaning no-till soybeans or managing your residue for corn on corn ground, I would highly encourage you to have meltdown on this fall as soon as you leave that field. We have warm temperatures now. Let those guys get as much activity in 70-degree weather versus waiting until Thanksgiving and, and, and then are, you're trying to get the activity out of them out of 40-degree weather. Um, I understand there's logistic things with that, but if you were truly after the residue piece, which we all hear every single spring, man, there's a lot of residue out there that I got to plant through. Okay, this is the opportunity to take care of it. Now, there's another piece of this that's the nutritional piece out of this, back to the nutrition that we have in that residue. That's where if you didn't get meltdown on the fall from the plantability aspect, apply it in the spring, and you're going to get that slow release throughout the growing season with, with the meltdown team. Well, I like the direction that you're heading with that because as a banker, obviously, that's the reason farm for profit matters. And with land leases being up 10 to 15 percent, with other inputs as far as seed and fertilizers going up 20 to 30 percent, you know, sometimes you've heard larger numbers than that. Our margins are going to be very compressed. And not only have farmers been forced to become efficient over the last couple of years because of lower commodity prices we have higher commodity prices and our margins may even be thinner than they have been historically. So it's super important to be extremely efficient. And uh, I like where you're coming from on activating what's already in the soils to, you know, take advantage of the resources you've already built up. We don't want to drain them, but just know what we actually have to to go after. Again, I, by by no means around this table, know the least amount (laughs) Of this, um, oh, Mason's but, over here. But I do know. <laughs> <laughs> I am new. I am new. Oh, what a jab! Okay, so Mason, I got a question for you. Oh boy. Because I couldn't answer it because I don't know enough, and I did get this from a customer. Maybe I shouldn't even say that because it might be a dumb question. There's no dumb questions, right, Bodie? Absolutely not. I, I ask know them all the time. Say so a drier year, drier year, we force root systems to go deeper. Therefore, they're ac- they're potentially accessing different zones of nutrients, stuff that's maybe been there for a while longer, whichever it is. I'm speculating. Is that a fact or a myth that drier years may leave more, um, more nutrient or uh, nutritionals for our plants next year than if we had a more oversaturated year with shallower root systems? Well, yeah, and it's kind of situational, but generally, yeah, there would be there would definitely be more nutrients um, just because moisture is obviously going to cause a lot more breakdown. It's going to cause more solubility from obviously just organic matter and whatever's already in your soil so yeah those saturated years like the last what six years of basically monsoon weather you know you've got a lot of solubilization happening you've got a lot of residue degradation then you've got a lot of leaching on top of that so in a dry year like this year there's probably still more there but not necessarily plant accessible okay that's a good point because you have to have water to drive it into the plant right right mm-hmm. yep. 
All right, boss, was that right? He did all right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little bit true that, that we potentially could have resources left in the soil more than on a typically uh, either average rainfall or above average rainfall season. I think that maybe the best way to answer that is, is, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, is you guys are always going to prefer a drier year in your guys' heavy soils. Mm -hmm. And so in a drier year, you're going to have likely higher yields. With higher yields comes a higher draw from that soil bank, yeah. leaving the more nutrients that, that Brody talked about in that residue simply because of of the bigger plant and the more yield that you created. So, you know, does it come from, does it come from deeper? <clears throat> the only way to really know that is, is to put radioactive isotopes in there and then start measuring that. Right. And that's going to happen at a university level. Um, what we do know is, is that, you know, there's, there's a continual cycle of nutrition in that top six inches with your weather events, right? Between yeah. exudates that's feeding your microbial populations, uh, between moisture that's making nutrients available. Um, so does it come from 24 inches? It, it, it could, but I don't know that sitting here today that we could say for sure in a dry year that yeah. we are pulling from deeper. Right. You know, whether you're in a dry year or you're in a moist year, I mean, it still starts at the base of that plant. You get that plant off to a stronger start, build that root factory that's there, you know, back to you know, why we focus on those fine root hairs, those exits is coming out by emergence to V2. I mean, that's what's going to drive that nutrient uptake. You know, I, it, I was just going to add that too. I mean, it, it, it's going to depend on what your roots are doing anyway. So if it's a, if it's a drought year, sure, you might have more in the soil, but it's not going to get into the roots because the roots just are not working as, as hard as they can probably. Um, and then also other limitation, just physical beyond, you know, roots, but, um, just compaction layers. A lot of guys have neglected a lot of soil over the last six years of heavy, wet conditions, you know, tillage, fro frozen tillage, wet tillage, that sort of thing. And so you might still have some compaction issues, even still limiting physically that root development. And that's where stimulating that root development to help with those physical limitations is going to help with that, that nutrient uptake. So this could be a good fall, potentially, if we stay in the pattern that we're in to help get some of those compaction issues worked out Right. if we are pro-tillage. So Bodhi said high yields, we're going to have a lot more nutrients in the plant, in the stover that's on the ground. But we're also going to be taking a lot more nutrients out with all you know 300 bushels per acre, right? We know there's X amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, micros in each kernel of corn that comes off. What are we doing to replace that? How are, is that we're going to put meltdown on and get that all back from microbes or what? You want to take a first step? Go sure, ahead. I'll take a first well, step. Well, because let me premise that because uh, the, the old, old school mind, the guy that comes from the university that works at the co-op is going to say, well, you remove 300 bushels per acre. We're going to come back in and, you know, do a replacement or a build program based off of that. Okay. Right. So on that program, you know, that's going to cost twice as much as what it did last year. Mm -hmm. So putting my old banker hat on, um, and then I don't play cards like I'd like to. Well, but 150 like pounds of MAP this year is going to cost about $62.62 an acre. So let me ask you this. In all the fields that you consult, Bodie, when was phosphorus ever your limiting factor? So I think that that can be answered a couple different ways. Are we talking phosphorus in the soil? Are we talking phosphorus in the tissue? So now you start talking 365, right? Mm -hmm. And you start talking about why I do what I do and why I came here. Um, and, and I think that's maybe the biggest misconception that, that is, exists amongst farmers. There's 20,000 pounds of phosphorus in an acre for a slice. It's just not available. You know, you take a Bray P1 or you take an Olson, and those numbers are going to be anywhere from a five to a 50 part per million, right? So a hundred pounds, take your part per million times two and that gets you pounds per acre. So on the top side, a hundred pounds is what registers as a Bray P1, okay? So you have 20,000 pounds. So now you have what, 19,900 pounds that is still in the soil that doesn't register on it's the soil test, anything. right? right? So, one of the biggest things that I said, and, and Brody probably is to the point now that he rolls his eyes when I, when I say it, <laughs> is chemistry reacts with chemistry. It always has and it always will. 
And we talked about this on the last show, actually, that I was on. We talked about the lime truck going out yep. and following it with the, the, uh, the map and the potash truck, right? Yep. And calcium is a two-plus charge. Phosphorus is an anion, right? So you have a cation and you have an anion. So I think the biggest thing that's, that's misunderstood is, is, is you could have the perfect soil test, but you could have trash tissue test. And at the end of the day, if we're not moving nutrition into the plant, what does it matter? What does it matter if your soil test looks perfect from an Iowa State or a Purdue or a Tri-State University? What, what, what does it really matter? And so that's why, you know, really why I started to get guys to take soils and tissues together so that you can monitor not only in the soil, but then you can monitor how effective and efficient am I at actually moving that pea into the soil. Because you have to ask yourself, right, as a banker, you're going to sit down and you're going to renew operating loans or you're not going to renew operating loans. And you're going to have growers that have to, t they have to ask the tough question, can I spend $63 an acre in just in FOSS? Right? Last year it was going to cost me 30 34 and now it's 30 extra dollars. Right, So that's really where this is at. We're not anti-fertilizer. Like I want to make sure that people understand that. Okay, If you talk to somebody from Biodyne or BW, we're not anti-fertilizer. We're just pro-farmer efficiency. And when we understand what our biology is doing and what that microbiome and that rhizosphere and what it is capable of doing, we start to look at things completely different. And that's where, you know, that's where we tell people, like, if you're just jumping into this journey with Brody or one of our other sales reps, don't cut all of your FOSS out. Don't want to, don't have to. Take some of those dollars out. If it costs you 62, spend 30 and spend $11 in meltdown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really what we want to be. We don't want somebody to think, oh, well, these guys are the snake oil guys. That is the quickest way to get labeled in a way that we don't want to be labeled. At the end of the day, we're helping growers raise bushels more effectively and more efficiently, and that's our goal. And so, you know, on my farm, we, haven't, we have not spread uh, MAP or DAP in five years. We put a little bit of FOSS in a row starter, and we look at the biological side. And our phosphorus levels in the soil test actually are raising. We've got data from Iowa as well, and we're happy to share it with anybody that is interested. But we've got data where our, our FOSS numbers continue to raise behind the biological system, the meltdown and the 401. And it's not only showing an increasing in the soil test, but it's also showing in the tissue test and the yields are following. Corey, as a farmer, what is one of your biggest questions going into the spring or even evaluating your crop at V4, V8 timeframe? Am I getting what I, the inputs that I put out there, are they getting into the plant? Yeah. Yeah, or I'm waiting for some some tissue tests. Exactly. Yeah, because Mason hasn't been there yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's running behind. <laughs> hadn't been anybody to honk at yet. Yeah. <laughs> but those are, you know, back to what Bodie said. Chemistry reacts with chemistry, but also biology. Back to the fence row again, is you know that barometer on you know if we have that biological activity that those that diversity that's there, those are the workers that help get that into the plant. A couple of things that I had thought about. But my first one is, is there's clearly a partnership between Farm for Profit and BW Fusion. This is not a secret, but that's not the point of this show. I mean, we're here because we have experts in the room. That's why we're recording this at nighttime is we couldn't pass up the opportunity to have Mason here and the, oh, sorry, and to have everybody here as a team, you know, to, to put down some information that's going to be really valuable for our listeners. And what I like the most about this is this is one way to go into a tight year, whether it's this year, the next one, 10 years from now, and really monitor your crop. There are other programs kind of imitating 365. Clearly, we've picked the far superior one, and I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek, but I also believe it. I mean, that's, we don't say things on this podcast unless um, that's something we believe. It, if you know come V4, V5, and you take your first samples, your second samples. I got to remember that'd be your second sample, correct? V4, V4. First tissue. First, first tissue. tissue. Yep. Okay. And we get some results back. We can adapt right there. We can make a choice. And that may dictate whether or not when we Y drop, what our mixture looks like. Or, spray or, your or when you spray your post. Correct. We're going to be able to make decisions in season when the dollars really matter. Just kind of like you said. So that was the first thing that I thought. When you said fence row and field row. I have a client that is working with another friend of the podcast that has created a new zone in each one of his fields for the outside six rows. And he is going to treat the outside six rows of every field 
differently than the rest of, you know, basically created his own zone on the borders and then has his zones inside the field as well. Just to test the theory, to play around with that, to see if he can push the potential of those outside rows. So he's going to push the fence row that's already doing really well? Yep. Well, from a you know biological standpoint, less competition um, probably. I mean, my only concern would be, okay, do we drive across that when we're leaving the field, you know, hauling stuff out and stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's some there's some different variables with the, the outside six rows with that. And really it's your outside three. Your outside – so I, I did a study a couple years ago that I walked in multiple fields, and I took the outside ear, I took the second ear, and I took the third ear. And when you get to the fourth ear, the fourth ear gets to normal. So fourth becomes the fifth, becomes the sixth, and you start to see the consistency. Put number one on a scale, and you're like, boy, if I could raise all of this, I'd have 450 bushel corn. Then you go to the second row, and it gets a little bit smaller. You get to the third row, and it gets a little bit smaller. So the outside three you know, is really going to drive the total six. But to that, I would say this, is it easier, right? Is it easier to take your tops higher or is it easier to bring your bottoms up? And it doesn't take very many zeros on a yield monitor. Think about a wet yeah. year. Yep. It doesn't take very many zeros on a yield monitor to negate every 300 that you saw. Yeah. And all of a sudden you got 160 bushel corn and it's 160 bushel corn that you feel defeated. For the year, it's probably a good year, but it's all of the zeros that you had. And so I, I think, you know, because what you have to understand is, yeah, you have to have, you got to have fertility, but you have to match the energy level, right? I'm talking the energy level of a plant. So yeah, the outside three rows, you're capturing extra sunlight. You're driving a higher energy level on that plant, but are you driving enough energy or enough fertility to keep up with the energy that you have? So I'm interested to follow this. I, I hope that you let me know and, and let me know how it goes. But, but I think for me, I think the easiest would be where can I take the weakest areas and try to drive them up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I think that's where I can bring consistency in and try to elevate those yields. Yeah, I'm interested too because this year we have a lot of that edge burning effect, especially on the south, southwest, but you can actually see it a lot. Like that was the stuff to first start firing if you were in any stress, just that heat blowing in. Is it by, by soybean fields as well? By, yeah, if you got, because there's, yeah. You no. guys are the only place. I mean, this is, you know, we're two states away. I mean, I live in Indiana, and here I am in Iowa. It takes me nine hours to get here, yeah. right? Not that far. But when we butt up against a soybean field, like, that's, our, that's some of our best corn. Yeah. You get out here, and you listen to these farmers talking, and they're like, oh, gosh, you know, I, I wish that guy would plant corn over here. You know, and you just listen to him. He's like, yeah, and, and, and you don't understand until you're here the the wind and the heat yep. that just comes off of that field and i think maybe if you guys paved some more roads and it, was, <laughs> <laughs> it is just nope, it's we a like blow our gravel torch. <clears throat> yeah, it's a blow torch and uh and sometimes i mean gosh there in july it was upper 90s for seven days in a row and and the lows were in the low 80s you know upper 70s i mean just it didn't get a chance to breathe so. yeah and that was in june this year too yeah june was hot yeah. yeah so i want to go back to a reference i made of playing cards because they're probably like why the heck do you talk about playing cards right <laughs> so uh, before Bodie had to interrupt me which is nothing new i'm used to it but you know i look at if you're going to put everything on in the fall you know that's like saying i'm all in on the very first hand whereas you know back to you know what we did with the tissue samples to say okay this is how we're going to react in season and now it goes no you know no different than what Bodie's talking about is taking those lower spots up. That's where 365 comes into play to say, okay, what is going on here that we're not experiencing up in the, the, the higher yielding parts of the field? And so how can we react to that in season or, you know, how do we build that next program, the program for the next year? And that's something I'm doing a lot of right now with the guys that have gone through the 365 program this year is saying okay now how do i how can i take this information based on you know the programs that are my application uh timings and abilities and just what i can handle logistically you know how can we build this program so i can react to things in season or help myself efficiently meet certain growth stages and, and have have nutrients there that i need it's one of those things you get people signed up for the agronomy 365 app yeah, yes, that. <laughs> Are you on yet? <laughs> yeah, I tried. I like that. So we did have a couple of listeners send in some questions, uh, more agronomy-related. So one of our listeners wanted us to, to try and find an expert or someone that we could bounce the idea off of 
the various ways of applying fertilizer. So we're, we could go the difference between fall applied and spring applied. And then I think you read the email that he was curious also about broadcasting or strip till or, uh, or other options that we would have available. So let's start first with fall applied versus spring applied. Do you guys have anything uh, one way or the other data or personal feelings on that? Yeah, so one thing that, that I say uh, quite frequently is is that agronomics, economics, and logistics all have to work together. If they don't, all we have is a really good plan that never gets executed. Um, so I, t I oftentimes put that back. And I had somebody tell me at a presentation that I did, I said, you know, or they said, you know, <clears throat> all agronomists are the same. And I said, what's that? I said, every one of your answers is depends. And uh, <laughs> we, are, we are very good at that. Um, yeah. but, but, it, but it truly is. You know, if a grower tells me, hey, I don't have the labor force to get it spread in the fall. Can I spread it in the spring? then you have to figure out Brody's job, our rep's job, is to figure out how to make a program fit within the constraints of what you have. So here's what I'll say. Does it have to be fall? No. Does it have to be spring? No. We've started doing probably on 35, 40,000 acres here in northwest Iowa. We've actually taken potassium and spread it in season. So we've, we've taken the fall apps out, we've taken the spring apps out, and we've actually put you know, some ammonium sulfate, some potash, and we've went in season and we've spread that. And what we typically see is, is we don't see maybe the big variances or the swings that we talked about because no doubt, right, no doubt that you, you gave your example of, of when you go over that sand with the chopper, right, and you get up there and it started firing a long time ago. Here's what I'll say. Mother Nature always gets her piece. She always has, she always will. But the piece she gets is smaller and smaller the more that we deploy management against that. So when we start to unpack and understand that what that rain is doing, is it the rain itself or is it what the rain is doing? And that's really where we just try to change the mindset. Like it's not, it's not just the rain. It's the fact that nutrients move with water. And if I have moisture in a profile that didn't have moisture, all of a sudden I have nutrition that is now available. So when we spread in season, the reason that we spread in season is simply this. You have a bank account. Let's just use that, okay? So you have a bank account. That's your false soil test. Let's say you have 255 part per million on a K a potassium acetate extract or even a malic. I don't care. That's going to be there, okay? It's, let's just say it's 255. You come around, you plant your corn into it. You start drawing down, right? Your wife starts shopping on Amazon, so your bank account starts going down, okay? Your plants are taking nutrition as they're growing when that bank account gets the lowest is typically in season when you have the hardest pull it's not in the fall so am i anti-fall or anti-spring the answer is no i'm not because i just told you it's got to be what works but what i've seen is is that we can really drive some efficiencies and we can drive some yield when we when we move that fertilizer in season when that bank account or that pool starts to get the lowest that makes a lot of sense do you think we're we're more efficient in season because we're giving it when it needs it like you could you could apply less i'm not a researcher possibly. okay so i can't give you this i can't tell you that it has been researched at a high level okay what i'll tell you is is that we'll pull 220 to 240 bushel corn on our farm with 75 pounds of potash and that's all that we've applied okay historically on our farm we were you know the we were the the retail was 150 pounds of map 300 pounds of potash for a two-year spread so we're doing that on 150 pounds over two years, 75 pounds each crop. So here's an opportunity where our inputs are way higher, and we typically, if you are typically a blanket fall spread, blanket spring spread, you know maybe we could be going and getting some better efficiency and saving some dollars and maintaining or raising yields, doing end season when the current, when the plot plant needs it. Right? So Mason, I'll put you on the spot though. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about NSERV? NSERV is a nitrogen stabilizer. Yeah. I wouldn't use it. Okay. So why? Because it's, so it makes sense as far as the concept, and I get that. Uh, as far as, you know, obviously stabilizing nitrogen, that's your money. You don't want it, you know, flowing away. The problem is that it's hurting your soil biology, which your biology on its own can hold uh, nitrogen to an extent. Mm -hmm. Bodhi's got a lot more in-depth theories of as far as that goes but you know for me and just like we we're talking about today it that biology can digest the nitrogen and then the nitrogen is being stored in a live in a living thing instead of killing your biology and 
that can throw your soils into a different imbalance. So your objective of, of protecting your nitrogen pool, sure, you, you met it, but what did you lose in, in a different aspect here of your field? I like that answer. And before Bodie jumps on top of that is I need to make a meme out of the reaction that came from both Brody and Bodie after I asked that question. That was one of the largest eye rolls. So, no, 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 I, this is just, this is being in the business for it's a young kid, yeah. and, and you love you love their, their drive and their desire. This is where I would just say, test it, right? Like, like, like test it, because we, we're not going to be experts on everybody's operation that listens to this podcast, so we don't want people to say, oh, well, I listened to Mason <laughs> on Farm for Profit, and that yes. kid said, Actually, I don't got to run in serve. So, no, I don't need it, right? Because... Maybe, Maybe I shouldn't even go here, right? But there's certain companies now that are starting to talk about just a major reduction in nitrogen if you use this product or that product. And, and I don't love it. I mean, we can show you all the data in the world that we're making nitrogen more available through our biology, through our teams. But nitrogen is extremely complex. And it's not as simple as, as cut 40 out, use this product, cut 50 out, use this product, cut 10 out, use this product. Because guess what happens? If you guys get... A really good moisture year and you feel like you're limited on the top end and you only raised 260 and I told you to cut 30 pounds of nitrogen out or 20 pounds and your neighbor didn't and he raised 280 guess who gets the first phone call <laughs> yeah yeah uh-huh so so that's where I say is his answer wrong no from a technical from a fundamental his answer is not wrong but from a liability standpoint no we don't want to say don't don't run in serve everywhere right. I mean, it's one of those these these two things that have come up. The two questions that uh, I've asked have come from customers, from from real farmers that are sitting here going, "Okay, if I have to think about cutting somewhere, maybe I don't do fall applied and I go spring because then I don't have the cost of insert, you know, or or or, I, or a stabilizer, whichever they're going to use. You know, it is everybody's really paying attention to. We finally got some decent prices. We're hoping that we have decent yields. We don't want to give that all back in the next year." Yeah, and I should back up, too, as far as your biology helping with that nitrogen staying there. It also depends on what your soil biology is like. So, I mean, you might not be able to hold on to your nitrogen near as well. And just like he was talking about with a wet year, mm -hmm. you know, um, you might lose that nitrogen if you don't have the right biology out there. Right. Wouldn't it suck if we paid $750 a ton for anhydrous and freaking all these 75 percent more for map and all this stuff and then prices go back to three bucks next year yeah. <laughs> we don't need to talk about that <laughs> that's where right. we need to have our commodities guy on and talk about forward pricing and protecting ourselves so, but, but that but that is part of this discussion right now because you tell me is the likelihood to go to six bucks or go to four bucks it depends who you talk to honestly i mean it is quite interesting you talk to someone who's got a bearish tone and they're going to tell you, oh, nope, we're definitely back to 350. Somebody who's more you know, bullish on where this could go because certain things are shut down. We're Jared ready to McDaniel. expand. Yeah, <laughs> the boom. Sky's the limits. We're not going to have a crop. So I, I agree. If you put it on a parabolic chart, I don't know. I haven't seen one of those. I see. just saw something that something got passed in Congress today that now employers have to start posting the salary ranges of where their current employees are getting paid to help with where people – so people don't feel like – I think that that ties in – exactly what you said i think you should ask somebody to show you their position on the board when they're bearish or bullish right, <laughs> right? like let's just put the cards on the table here let's yeah. find out why you're bearish or bullish yeah i like that yep is a pound of nitrogen okay what was the first one no is any pound of nitrogen equal to a pound of nitrogen meaning the form of what you're putting oh, down okay, there at okay. a certain time i didn't even a fair question because we don't even have enough time we're already over the time well, limit i'm but sure he can he can cut stuff His, out. right so is a pound of feathers weigh more than a pound of bricks Yes. No. No. <laughs> you had to think, though. You doubled But that. you said yes. That's why I had to think. Well, why is he saying yes? Well, quickly to see uh, what you were reaction Yeah, no was way. Be. Okay. All right. Let's start with nitrogen here. Is a, is a pound of nitrogen a pound of nitrogen all across the board? It's so like if you apply it, do you get a pound? We're is that what you're trying to say? forms of nitrogen. So I, I think this was a Twitter debate last year. Um, you had is this people, one of them test this, weight? I was going to say, is it, this it is also? Very, it is very similar to that. It, okay. it, it is. Uh, you know, so you've got the crowd that, that believes that, you know, hey, if I run anhydrous, um, 
I, I raise my biggest yields with anhydrous, right? Well, then you have the other crowd that says, well, if you run anhydrous, you're just killing all of your soil, right? All of the biology in your soil. So you got to run liquid. Well, the guy that runs anhydrous to, to the guy that runs liquid says, well, your corn sucks and my corn's better. To the guy that's running liquid, to the guy that's running anhydrous says, well, I'm not killing my soil and my yields are just fine. So ammoniacal nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen. Uh, ammoniacal would be ammonium, which would have a positive charge, NH4+. Plus. Nitrate would be NO3 minus, right, negative. So nitrate is anything that can leach. Nitrate is extremely gummy, Okay. So when the plant takes up nitrate, and it will, if you have a lot of nitrate sitting in your soil system, it will take it up. It moves in via mass flow, okay? So that means what mass flow is is every time that a corn plant takes a drink of water, nitrogen comes with it. That's mass flow. High levels of nitrate, oftentimes, high levels, not, not just some nitrate. High levels of nitrate will actually restrict or block the movement of potassium and sulfur into the plant. So... Why is, nit- why is potassium, why is sulfur important? Because you have to have nitrogen, you have to have potassium, you have to have sulfur, you have to have molybdenum. You have to have sugars and starches to create what? To create protein. And at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. We're trying to create protein, and we're trying to do it very efficiently. So the next thing that we're talking about in BW is, is, is what forms of nitrogen is present at what times, and what tissue results do we see at? So Brody and his three-hour drives to Nebraska um, oftentimes decide that that's a perfect time to have a nitrogen discussion. So we have a lot of these. Um, And and again, I'll say the same thing that I said uh, when we talked about uh, Mason's question um, is it depends, right? Like some environments, nitrate is a really good way to go. One, you're set up for it. Your pHs are perfect for it, right? In a high pH environment, in a high pH environment, when you apply nitrate, when a plant takes up nitrate, it actually releases a bicarbonate, and a bicarbonate elevates your pH. Okay, so you take a high pH and you make it higher, right? If you've ever looked, and I know you have, right? If you ever look at the charts of your nutrient availability, right? You have the low pH side and you have the high pH mm-hmm. side, and then you have right in the middle where you want to be. Yep. Well, as we start to get on that high side, we start to see that our macros and some of our micros don't release very well, okay? So in those environments, we have challenged people. If anhydrous is, and I know that there's some people that are going to listen to this and say, you work for a biological company, how in the world could these words come out of your (laughs) mouth? Again, agronomics, economics, and logistics, they all have to work, okay? But if if you're in a 7.5 pH, applying all UAN might not be the best form of nitrogen for your farm, which would then make the case true that a pound of nitrogen truly is not a pound of nitrogen. Because your ammonium, when the plant, and I didn't talk about this, so when a plant takes up ammonium, it actually releases a hydrogen ion. Okay, so this is soil chemistry, right? So you have base saturations. You have calcium two plus charge. You have magnesium two plus charge, you have potassium single charge, then you have hydrogen, and then you have sodium, right? And those are your five major cations that make up your base sats. When you have hydrogen register on a soil test, the first place you need to look is your pH every time. So if you see hydrogen show up, Corey, on your soil test, just go look at your pH because hydrogen occupies the space that calcium wants to. And the moment that you go and apply lime, on that zone, on that grid, whatever it is, your hydrogen goes away and your calcium comes up. And I would say almost every time. So in a high pH environment, what do we want to do? We want to acidify it. Yeah, we want to lower it. So that's where we look at using ammonium sources, whether it's AMS, whether it's urea, whether it's anhydrous, whatever it might be. We're trying to get the positive form of nitrogen out there to acidify that, to lower that, to get more availability of our nutrition. Hmm. I think that's what gives it validity is you're not the one sitting there beating the drum that oh, anhydrous is killing your soil or whatever. Right? It's truly, it depends. It truly depends. What's the best way to give advice? It's like the weatherman. <laughs> 60% of the time. It, it just works depends. Every time. It might, rain, <laughs> it might rain at my house. It might not rain at my house. That was a really bad example. <laughs> but there's one point here as well, and just the value back to 365 again and how we're pulling those apart, the nitrate ammoniacal levels, and saying, okay, 
what are the dominant levels in your soil? A lot of that's driven by your seed in or carbon and nitrogen ratios. And so, you know, that's where those things come into play and how you build a program out and what could be the most effective form of nitrogen, not just saying, well, I'm, I'm getting 32% at the best price. That's what I'm going to go with type thing. Cause it may not give you the best result or anhydrous or whatever. Right. So if we're sitting at six pH, should we not be using anhydrous? I think you have to be careful. I, I really do. Because a, a pound of ammonium nitrogen is going to precipitate about 1.1 or 1.2 pounds of calcium. And if you're in a 6 pH, you don't have an abundance of calcium. If you did, your pH would be higher. So you do have to be careful. You have to be careful. So that's where those people that are talking about anhydrous makes your soil hard and kills it. That's what it is, is those guys that are putting anhydrous on but aren't paying attention to the calcium, right? Because calcium drives flocculation or porosity or, or that in your soil. So if we're precipitating that out and making that lower, of course your soil is getting harder. So you have to watch it. I would say if, if, if anhydrous is what you have available or if anhydrous is significantly cheaper. And I was talking to an input supplier a week ago saying that there's some significant spreads between anhydrous and urea and UAN. And as a banker, what are you going to tell your grower to do? If, if there's a, let's just say there's a 20 cent spread. There's a 20 cent spread per pound of actual in and Corey's your customer and he comes in and he's wanting to renew an operating line. He says, well, you know, I'm working on this biological side and they told me that I should not run anhydrous because it's bad for my soil, right? And for 200 pounds of in, it's going to cost you, let's just say UAN 60 cents. I don't know what it is. I'm making it up. Yep. Okay. So it's 60 cents. What's that cost? 120 bucks an acre? Hey, okay. let's say that anhydrous is 40, right? That's 80 bucks. Yeah. That's 40 bucks an acre of potential net profit in just your forms of nitrogen, right? So I think there's going to be those discussions that are happening. So that's where I give Brody a lot of grief because. He knew that it was going to make me go off on a tangent. <laughs> but, but I do think that, as you talked about, is, um, you know, commodity prices are up, and so is everything else. And these discussions are going to happen because you're going to have more dollars in play, but maybe potentially the same net profit or lower. You know, right, if I go on my soapbox for 30 seconds? Go. Your question about the bankers is valid because there aren't good bankers everywhere. They will see that and they will tell you not to do it. They'll say, nope, I'm not going to approve that. You're overspending because XYZ customer is not spending that. And that's not right. You need to put a plan together. And that's the biggest thing I think I pulled out of what, what Brody was saying is that this is a well-thought-out, well-orchestrated plan and that can evolve. And if I can do my best, unless you got more questions, if I can do my best way to kind of summarize what I pulled out of this, because like I said, sitting around this table – I am by far the one that knows the least about this. And this has been really fun for me to, to grab some new knowledge. I mean, honestly, I'm going to pull so much more out of this when I edit it, listen to it again, and then once it's published, pull it out because there's some really good key parts. But what I'm seeing is you need to be ready to invest where you see opportunity, whether that is in the form of nitrogen that you're using or in-season application or not using n like, you know, using something beneficial makes sense yeah. yeah i'm making fun of you guys get the point is this is kind of one of those things if, if you think about football because we're in the middle of football season and obviously iowa state's one of the best teams in the in the nation yeah and you look at the way matt campbell coaches his team the way they start the football game is not the way they come out second half at halftime okay. their halftime adjustments last weekend just sucked the whole time but i'm this episode's <laughs> coming out in october we're gonna have a lot better season okay, all right we're, go, we're going strong so you, you sit there and you look at any good football coach. The difference between a good football coach and, a, and one that is average is the in-game adjustments. And that's what I see the most out of this program and why I'm the most excited, excited to have BW Fusion as a partner. And I, I, I promise that I'm not just saying that. It's stuff that I've witnessed throughout our, our nine months together is let's get some tests. Let's actually see what's going on. Let's make the best decision for our farm because it does. It just depends. And ultimately, then we try to make ourselves the most profitable. Can I edit the show? Have at it. Good, because I'm going to get, there are no good bankers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be so dangerous. That's why I don't turn the editing over to you. 
That, that, you bring up one really good point, and I think you probably only one. Well, I guess the current <laughs> point. Sorry, Tanner. he was only listening to what he wanted to hear. Typical <laughs> male, right? So and that's I t- the one. Point. I typically do that. It's good with at doctoring voting, but, data. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> The point I'm trying to make, though, is is when you hear us talk about this, I mean, we're very passionate about it. And it's not because, you know, we have a tunnel vision on one certain thing. You're so passionate that I've become passionate. It, well, that's good. So, you know, and I hopefully that, you know, reflects to the people that Bodie works with, Mason works with, I work with, our other folks work with. You know, it's not, you know, back to a one-size-fits-all. Um, we have to really understand things. And one thing that, that I've kept with me um, when I was able to pick – David Hula basically chauffeur him around for a day and a half uh, a few years ago when I worked for Pioneer. And, and that, th- that thing was is, was the last question before I sent him off on, on the plane to go home. And I said, um, or I asked him, you know, you've been with Farmers for Iowa for a day and a half now. And at that time, his record is 429. He's well past that. And I said, what, you know, being with them, do you think it'd be easier or harder to raise you know 500 bushel corn here in iowa and he's like i gotta farm this thing for five years first before i really understand what's going on and this is where we're at with the entire thing that we're we're providing with the microbes the 365 the fur rec- recommendations different things to be able to stimulate add stress mitigation to that that crop throughout the growing season um is that you know we're still in what year two th- going on three now I mean, we're just hitting our wheelhouse and knowing where we're at today and what this thing has evolved to um, is, is quite amazing. I don't disagree one bit. And this is going to be a little bit different episode because we kind of flew by the seat of our pants. So to summarize, you're just going to have to listen to it again. Yeah, I think, I mean, I was going to say actually in the middle when when Bodhi was talking about nitrogen, I about said when he started going, I about interrupted and said, you might want to listen to this or be ready to replay it because there's going to be a lot of words thrown around and you know one of the to me i got to listen to that like three times my my biggest eye-opening moment was when i mentioned uh the potential program of taking the outside six rows out and and bodie mentioned to me to us that is it easier to take your high yielding high potential areas and make them better or is it easier to take a lower for example, zeros and turn them into something worthwhile. You know, what, what's going to have the most net effect on your farm? That was a, uh, a really cool portion for me that, that kind of hit home. I sat back in my chair and went, huh. Which is weird because some of the things that I've heard from different agronomy sources is maybe you leave those areas behind. You know, you take your money, your dollars from those areas because they're consistently not paying you back and you put it into areas that are. I guess that's where, uh, my parents always accuse me of being pretty hard-headed. It runs in the family. I'm the kind of guy that I want to dig in and find out why things aren't working rather than just saying, oh, they're not working. Let's throw our hands up and let's move on. Yeah. Right? I would say in our case, when we're variable rating fertilizer and things like that, typically the places we aren't spending money is like the heavy, wet soils because we consistently get zeros. And when we do have a dry year, they still just puke out corn. Absolutely. Because they haven't been using the fertilizer you put on them for years and years and years and years. So why spend money on them? Yeah, the only thing you need there is tile. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And yeah, tile's easy. You got to find the outlet. Yeah, no, (laughs) I mean, for sure. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you need in that environment. It's, it's, there's no, well, let's put, you know, a a rate and a half or two, two X rate of fertilizer and we're going to make those problems go away. No, you got to get the water off. Right. Yep. So, yes. We, you should have seen Corey and I before we got on these mics. It was one of those ultimatums. We will not record unless we have something great for our listeners as far as an offer goes. So, Brody, why don't you let our listeners know, just because they listen to Farm for Profit podcast, what they can get out of BW Fusion before we sign off. Yeah, so for, for the fourth quarter, um, you know, we know that the microbial team, seven years running now and continue to – to just amaze us and we continue to, to pull more and more information out of uh, especially using the 365 program what they're doing for our soil profile what they're doing for nutrient availability what they're doing for bringing nutrients into the plant um, so for the fourth quarter between now and december 20th because i don't want to work that hard between christmas and new year's like a lot of other people may want to so we're going to cut it at december 20th i don't here. know if you understand this but 
there will be a ton of sales between the 20th and the 31st. I understand. <laughs> that just gives me a little lag time, just in case. He, he's going to be working until it's the 31st. Gonna, uh, I know. I know. Uh, sorry, my wife. Sorry, just to one, lay but, out. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, what we're offering for the fourth quarter here, and, and this goes to, to really showing, you know, it's not about just putting something out there. It's about let's learn why. Let's understand why. You know, even back to the six row outer rows, I was thinking, you know what? He needs to put a location through 365 on that spot, and he needs to go to the worst spot of his farm and understand what's the difference between the two. Yeah. So growers that purchase 500 acres of Meltdown in 401 and have them paid for by December 20th, and use the promo code off of the uh, off of the website or access to the website. We'll get uh, one free field into the 365 program for next year, um, which covers the lab fees of that. They'll still be responsible for whoever takes the samples and then the shipping costs. On Getting those it samples. to the lab. Yep. yep, that makes a lot of sense. So, listeners, I don't know if you caught that, but if you sign up 500 acres for Meltdown and 401 this fall, fourth quarter. 401 team there's different versions team. that we have okay putting both microbial teams out there yep in the fourth quarter 2021 so if you guys pick this up in 22 sorry you're too late you'll have to beg them for the discount <laughs> uh, beg, beg them to sign you up but that's going to get you at least one one fee one free field in a 365 program yep and that is either through farmforprofit.com uh follow the link there or you know, if you really want to make it hard on them, you can call BW Fusion, mention that you heard on Farm for Profit Podcast. Yeah. They're not going to be super excited about that route. That'll be all right. So go to the website, but they're certainly not going to let us Call down. Brody or one of the sales staff. Yeah. Right? So Brody, what's your number? I'll put my number, 515-650-0501. And my email is brodyb at bw-fusion.com. Loves you're you're late, gonna have to help late, them. Brody night texts. B R O D Y. Y. Yeah, yep. not an I E like I -E. Bo D. I'm Bro D. <laughs> I got the better name. You got the right way to spell it. Yes, yeah. the right way with the Y. Text so B R O D Y B at B W fusioncom Awesome. So that's a exclusive offer. You only get to hear it here on Farm for Profit podcast. So make sure you go out there and you let them know where you heard it. Uh, that's how you get this put together. It could be really valuable to you in a year to where we're facing another round of tight margins. Absolutely. This was fun. We did this late night. We haven't done a late night podcast recording for a long time. Bodie, thanks for traveling. What would you say, nine hours just to get here? Yep, right at nine and a half hours to get here. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for popping in, introducing us to Mason. It looks like you got a promising career ahead of you. It's gonna. We're gonna have to. So. We're gonna have to check in and ask you all these hard questions. Uh, see if Hopefully. we can't uh, test those against the boss's opinion. And of course, Brody, thanks for being. Uh, our connection here with BW Fusion. We appreciate their partnership. Corey, you got anything else before we send them out? No, my, ch my challenge is just to follow what these, these guys said. Give Brody a call. I like it. That works. Listeners, thank you for tuning in. Farm for Profit LLC at gmail.com. If you ever have any topics that you want us to talk about, don't forget to like, rate, review, and share with your friends. And until next week, we'll talk to you then. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long.